Thanks, everybody, for tuning in on the Run and Plays podcast. Kareth Burke, Logan Murdoch, and our special guest, Warriors assistant coach, Jaron Collins, here today. Really nice to see you, Jaron. How you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, uh, we've heard from Bob Myers this week. We've heard from Steve Kerr this week. It's excellent to hear from you as well. So just to get right into it, Steve explained that the preference for the Warriors is not getting together for a summer camp or a summer league that is with the eight teams not going to Orlando. He said he would rather see, you know, one or two like OTAs, I guess, um, like the NFL has where the Warriors as a team can get together at the facility. What do you think that would do for you guys when you're staring down a pretty long summer? Well, I think what you said at the end was the most important thing is that, you know, our last game was in March and we don't know when the, excuse me, 2020, 2021 season would, would start, presumably in December. That's just a long time to be um, uh, without basketball activities for us as an organization, for us as a team. Um, so we want to have guys uh, get in and, you know, and get the development and the skill development that they need um, individually and collectively. Uh, understanding that anything that um, going forward would have to be negotiated obviously through and, and clear through the league and through the players association. What kind of development is essential for this summer to build on what you guys had last season, which was a big development season, uh, but to make sure guys are in training programs, to make sure guys understand, you know, what the Warriors are about to have those good habits for next season? Well, it's getting the veteran leadership that we have with uh, Steph, um, Clay, Draymond, um, those guys, the foundation, foundational pieces, incorporating them with uh, Andrew, um, you know, presumably whoever the pick is, um, bringing along our young guys and, uh, and Jordan, and Eric and Marquise, and, and then um, someone like Kavon Looney, who's um, on the rehab, on the mend right now. So those opportunities to all come together, um, to learn from one another, to see um, the, what the veterans have, have laid down and just um, continue to grow um, going forward. I talked to uh, Bob Myers the other day and I asked him, and I'm going to ask you the same question. I asked him, will this help or, or hurt you guys going forward, the long layoff? You guys might have at least nine months um, since you guys last played a game. How will that, I guess, help or hurt you? What did Bob say? <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Well, look, uh, I, I think that um, uh, obviously not having competitive games for an extended period of time uh, is, is a bit of a disservice um, to guys' competition and to their, um, to their skill development. And so you want guys to get competitive play. So I think that in the long term, um, obviously time will tell with all of this stuff. Um, but I think that competitive play will only help and benefit. Yeah. And Steve was talking about uh, mini camps the other day and, and having an OTA likes, uh, I, I guess mini camps is the way to go, but how do you make sure you have that competitive balance when say, if you have a mini camp a month from now or two months from now, how do you keep the competitive balance going for those few months? It's difficult. It's extremely difficult. And I think a lot of us obviously are in uncharted territory. Um, there, there is no summer league. Um, those opportunities for Jordan or Eric to play in summer league. Um, Kai, you know, go down the list of all the young guys that we have. Um, so I, I think it's going to be one of those challenges for us um, in our individual workouts to keep things competitive, to keep, to keep the guys motivated. Um, but we would benefit from uh, – an OTA type style situation where we could get everybody um, on the same, in, in there at the same time. Um, we can go through our offensive and defensive schemes. The guys can see one another, they can work together. Um, and then we can start to form those bonds that we're going to need to carry us forward. Along with this OTA idea, Steve wanted to specify that it is not optional. It would not be voluntary. And he would expect that the, the uh, veterans on your team would ask to be there. They want to do the work. When it comes to the veterans you have, especially the nucleus of Steph yeah. and Clay and Draymond, what kind of hunger do you think they'll have to get back to being a contender next season? Those guys are some of the most competitive people I've ever been around. Um, you know, they're, they're always looking for an extra edge. Um, I think a lot of people doubting um, them, us, um, going forward would just add fuel to the fire for all those guys. Uh, Clay, 
I can go down the list, but Steph, Clay, Draymond, all of them are so tough uh, mentally, physically, um, spiritually, emotionally. I mean, they, these guys have been uh, uh, tried and tested, battle tested, as they say. Um, so I, I know that any um, motivation, any fuel that they can, um, any naysayers out there, they're looking to prove everybody wrong again. Um, so I, again, I, I love working with this group of guys and just seeing um, their development and, um, and the things that they do. It's absolutely amazing. Can you, can fans or can people in this moment in time even appreciate what that trio is, the talent this roster has with Steph Clay and Draymond, their homegrown talent, they have contributed to a dynasty. Where do you think these three will fit in like NBA history? The long view. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, um, Hall of Famers, yeah, I start with that. So um, I, I think that all of them are on that path um, to be in the Hall of Fame, which says a lot. Uh, again, like, I'm, like I said, some the most competitive people I've ever been around, I've been around John Stockton, Carl Malone, Steve Nash, um, my brother, uh, and I've known a lot of guys in this league, and they're right up there as far as just downright, nasty competitiveness um, um, and again their talent um, their success the hard work that they've put in um, that trio uh, will go down as arguably one of the best trios um, in basketball and uh, you know their, their story is still um, to be told I, I think one of my favorite games in this run uh, was the 2019 uh, game six against Houston and that was when uh, in 2019, when uh, yeah. when Kevin the, the game after Kevin got hurt, and you saw those three guys kind of put the team on their back. What yeah. do you remember about that game, and why does why does Steve Kerr call that his favorite game of all time? Uh, obviously, being uh, shorthanded anytime you were going into a game without someone um, of the talents of a Kevin Durant. Or, um, our team wasn't um, at 100%. Um, and if you look at that first half, if I'm remembering back correctly, a lot of basketball games, but I believe Steph maybe had zero points or three points in the first half. Yeah, and I know that he, he didn't score that many points in the first half, but then he exploded in the second half. Um, and you look at how um, they did it. Um, it was the pick and roll with Draymond and Steph. It was the bread and butter and the spacing and then guys making the right play out of the pick and roll and out of the uh, advantage situation. So it was hitting Draymond in the pocket and doing what he does best, playmaking. Uh, it was shot making by Steph and Clay, um, especially in that fourth quarter. And um, a little special shout out to Jacob Rubin for hooking Steph up with the, 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 the shoes that he wore in that game. Um, which were an ode to his uh, first MVP season, if I'm not mistaken. But shout out Jake and Ru Jacob Rubin. And, and building off of that, <laughs> we know that we know that uh, that's Steve's favorite uh, game of the of the run. What is your favorite game of this run? My favorite game. Uh, my favorite game. I couldn't even remember what uh, it was against Portland, and it was the closeout where we swept them. I couldn't even remember what year, but it was the first quarter of um, when, we, when we swept Portland. I can't remember what year, but it was shock and awe. We, we, I mean, it was, it was everybody rolling, uh, Steph. I think we scored 40 some odd points. Was um, that the year of Kevin's first year? In Golden State, it might, it might have been. It might have been 2017, I believe so, but don't hold me to that. Um, but it, anyway, it was in Portland, and it was the closeout game, and you know, the, it, it it was absolutely awesome. And it was, and, and, and I'm telling you, like we were rolling on on all cylinders. It was uh, Javel coming off the bench and catching a one-handed dunk. Um, Andre and Pat McCall jumping on the bench. Andre didn't even want to check in because it was like, you know, just classic Andre. I'm not even going to go in, you know, sort of thing where 
And I think we scored 40 some odd points and it was just, just complete shock and awe dominance. And the best part about that game, why I love it so much, was Mr. Fab was sitting behind our bench. And he was like, this is for Corey Maggetti. This is for the Corey Maggetti years. This is for... But he was talking so crazy. And he was behind our bench and he was standing up and he had the, the, jer- the Warriors jersey on. That, that, was, that, that, that game was complete dominance um, by a, a team that was locked in. Um, so that, 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 was, uh, that was fun to be a part of that. Regarding the protests and all of the people who have come out, um, what did you notice about speaking out and being met with some resistance um, when your brother Jason came out as the first openly gay man in the NBA? Did you kind of get a, a taste of, of what this would be like fighting for rights? You know, did you get a, a picture of that um, based on your brother's experience? Um, I, I think that what's important is that the more conversations we have about, you know, we're talking about different subject matter, but the more conversations we have, um, whether we're talking about my brother or we're talking about the, um, Black, Li- Black Lives Matter, um, is that we get more education, uh, more conversation, and more dialogue between people to make them aware of different situations and that we move the needle as a society going forward. And um, I think that that's something that helped prepare me in that there were conversations that need to be had. Um, people needed to step up and give support uh, for one another and, and deal with empathy and looking through another person's eyes. So for me, I can't be uh, more proud of the NBA and the NBA community, um, the way that um, our players are rallying people um, organizing, um, uh, whether it be protests or speaking engagements to help educate people um, on what it is to be a black man or black or person of color um, in our society. Uh, the WNBA as well has done a fantastic job. Um, all of our players and our executives um, being so vocal and being um, taking advantage of the platform they have to be the civic leaders and social leaders that they need to be. That's a really gracious answer to have empathy in this moment, because I would imagine you guys can tell me far better than I could say that there's an exhaustion to these conversations that have been happening for years, decades, centuries. Why might this moment finally feel like a moment where change is possible? Logan, you want to jump in on and answer that one? I know. I think the, the, big, the biggest, the first I will go is the biggest difference for me. And obviously you've seen more than I have, you know, with the LA riots, but I, I do know that um, it just seems like there's more people here for the, for our cause. It's not just black people. I remember the night Oscar Grant died and I remember the, the fallout from that. Um, there were protests, no doubt, but there wasn't this many different types of people in this protest. I'd never, I, I didn't, I didn't see that. Um, in 2014, there was a little bit more, but I think from 09, the first time I kind of got this to see this firsthand in my community, uh, to now has been totally different. You know, they're, they're protesting in Germany and in Belgium and in Australia for Black Lives, um, and I I've never seen anything like that before. I would push I would push it to you too. Like, what is the biggest difference for you from the '92 riots to now? Uh, what I, w- I would just echo on the statements that, or sentiments that you just made, um, it's the amount of people and the diversity within the people that are protesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so I went to a protest here in Los Angeles on the west side, okay. and I was blown away. Um, <laughs> it's with... <laughs> I think that you're, you're saying that you went to a protest on the west side in Los Angeles yes. says so much because I yes. when I was I was going to ask you that like what is it like to see 92 riots was confined to a certain space we always talk yes. about that but to yeah. see people on Fairfax and Melrose protesting for black lives how was that for you to see that being you know growing up in LA yeah that, I mean it's 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 incredible when you think about how many people um, are 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 out there protesting. Um, I was on uh, where was a veteran in, in Wilshire at the federal building um, on the west side, and predominantly white. The people protesting, uh, people honking the horns, predominantly white, 
you know, like signs of support. Um, so to me, it's uplifting, it's encouraging um, that we are having these conversations, that we are having this dialogue, um, that we as African Americans are able to share our experiences um, and everybody's seeing what's going on with the police, the police brutality, uh, systemic racism um, that we have in our society. And people want change. People want better. People want more. And I just have a lot of friends saying, what can I do to help? Mm -hmm. And it's about education. It's about spreading the message. Um, and there are different causes and there are different um, um, calls to action that we can all take. But I think the first thing we have to do is be able to, two things, listen to one another and have empathy for one another. And I think that's a good starting place and the communication will come. And that was funny you said that because uh, we were doing our, our show with Steve Kerr, uh, Race in America, which was a candid conversation, shameless plug. But we were doing that and, and we asked Steve about allyship and he said the biggest reason why he tries to be an ally at all times is because of empathy. Um, yeah. What has Steve been, how has it been to see your boss and uh, the head coach of, a, of an NBA team be so, a white man, be so on the front lines against police brutality? Because you look on his Twitter, he is, is going in on a lot of things like this. What is, how do you feel to be working with someone like that? First of all, it's incredible to work um, with Coach Kerr. Steve is incredible. Um, he's so vocal. He stands up for what he believes in. Um, he's going to be on the right side of history, looking back on a lot of different things. Um, but he, he's someone who gets it, that he has a powerful platform. Mm -hmm. And to understand that, you know, yes, you know, we're, we're here to play basketball, but we're also leaders in our community. Mm -hmm. And we have to be shining examples of what's right and what's true. And he's not afraid um, to speak. Um, from a place of authenticity and honesty um, and what and say what needs to be said. And I, I appreciate him for his words and his strength of character. And he's an incredible boss, an incredible person to work with and work for. Yeah. Uh, and and with, with the league uh, and the NBA, I know that um, you know, they have been uh, one of the more progressive leagues, I would say. Um, but how do you – but when it comes to coaches and coaches of color – um, at least head coaches of color, there hasn't been um, as many as we would like to, you know, to keep up with the amount of black players in the league. How do we get more black coaches and coaches of color in the head, in the, in the league uh, chair and and give, and also give them time to um, make mistakes and also find their way through those mistakes? Well, I think that um, success obviously is uh, something that will allow people to get more opportunities. Um, so it's, it's not easy, first of all. I, I mean, the first, the first part of it is it's not easy. Mm -hmm. So to get an opportunity, there are only 30 jobs, obviously, 30 head coaching jobs. Um, to be in the discussions, to have your name mentioned um, is important. But what we, what we need is support. We need support, like you're mentioning, for uh, development, uh, for persons of color um, once they get into those positions. Um, but obviously, you know, winning helps with everything. Uh, so hopefully, given those opportunities, you see the development as um, from, from a coaching perspective, you see the development of the players under the said coach. And then you see, hopefully, you get the opportunity to grow and to develop um, uh, for the future because um, there are more opportunities, hopefully there will be more opportunities for people of color to be head coaches. Um, but uh, a lot of it comes down to um, success. How successful are you when you get those opportunities and things that we can do to support and, 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 and help uh, people of color get, uh, reach that level of being a head coach. Jaron, your name is in those conversations for these head coaching jobs. You're on those hot coaches to watch for. Um, what, what would it take? I'm trying to figure out a, a nice, a good way to ask you this. What would it I take suppose, for him to leave? What would it take for him to leave? What sort of situation would you want um, as a head coach and understanding the, the importance of having a black man in that role? Like what would the things, what would you need to leave the Warriors and find the best environment? 
Well, first of all, I, I think, like, as I mentioned before, there are only 30 of these jobs in the world. So any situation um, is one that you have to look for um, and look for with the type of energy and spirit that, um, hey, I can go do this and be successful in it. Um, having said that, like with anything in life, it comes down to relationships, strong relationships. So I would want a strong relationship with um, my owner, strong or the, the team, the team's owner, strong relationship with the GM or the president, and strong relationship with the players. Um, when you have those type of bonds, when you have those type of relationships, you have the foundation to build. And so, anything like that is um, something that I'm 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 always um, looking for. Having said that. I consider myself truly blessed and fortunate to be with the Warriors. So I'm not in a rush to leave. Um, I've got a, I, I'm very, very fortunate. Um, the man I get to work for and the guys I get to coach, um, I realize how blessed I am in the position I'm in. And if a situation presents itself, like I said, one of 30, um, you, I, I, you have a, it's an honor and a duty um, to, to do my best. Um, going forward. Hey, just because I'm, I'm curious, like what do, <laughs> in those head coaching conversations, like what do front office members ask you and what do you ask them? Uh, well, you, more of a, like I said, it goes down to relationships. So it's like, you know, tell us about yourself. Um, what are your beliefs? What are your values? Um, you know, how would you run an organization? What type of people do you want in the building? Uh, what do you see as a, um, important to you know as a word it's a important important to uh, raise and develop young players um as far as taking an older team to the next level um you know talk to me about your relationships with certain players um you know so it, a, a lot of it is just conversations just getting to know one another um questions i'm asking them um you know what are their values what do they um stress um and then also it goes and it extends beyond the, the basketball court. So what's important in the community? Um, uh, type of leadership are you looking for? How vocal? Um, and a, a lot of these things, hopefully, you know, whether it, it, it's different from coach to coach, because everybody has to be true to themselves as far as their own coaching style. Um, but you're just trying to get a, a good feel for one another in these, um, in these interviews. And then, of course, you're talking – um, schemes, offensive, defensive schemes, up tempo, slow it down. You know, uh, you're gonna trap. Um, you're gonna play zone. You know, just what when you know, o uh, ATOs. What are your what are your adjustments? What are your plays? You know, just you know, what's your basketball basketball acumen? What's your basketball IQ? Um, so those conversations usually last a long time, but it's really the uh, getting to know the feeling out process. Um, uh, when you when you go through that, and so I, I think that um, you know, coaching, and I do want to talk about uh, the uh, or the new the new news about guys going to Orlando. How would you coach through that? How would you, if you were a head coach, how would you coach through? You know, you might not see your family for a, at least a month or two. How do you make sure guys are engaged if you were the head coach? How do you do that during this wild time? That, that's that's a good question. That's extremely difficult. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of people are going to be going through this. <laughs> you know, like I said, it, it's it's a new world, um, and it's and it's extremely difficult to be away from your your family for an extended period of time. Um, all of us have gotten used to now Zoom and Ring and uh, teleconferencing, um, FaceTiming. I would imagine a lot of that uh, would be taking place excuse me um but I, I honestly i, I, I there, there's a lot of gray areas a lot of unknown as far as moving forward um uh, to making sure that your players are connected to their families um and, and allowing for that um uh, the, the whole the holistic approach is to not just the, the you know the, the personal performance but mm -hmm. how do they um you know function as, as a human being in going forward in society um and so for in the nba returning to orlando in the bubble i know the players want to have their families and i think the logistics of that will be worked out um but i think it is uh something to be 
recognize that it's going to be difficult. It's going to be challenging for players, coaches, referees, everybody who's going in that bubble um, going forward. But I know that the coaches will do their best to make sure that everybody's connected with their families and, um, uh, and doing what they can to, to maintain the closeness and the bond that they have to help them as a, as a holistic person. Do you feel like the league this season owed it to the players to find the healthiest situation to crown a champion this season? Absolutely. I think so. Um, I think guys, guys are competitive, you know, I mean, that's like the number one thing in, in you know, in our industry and, you know, guys are so competitive. They they want to go, they want to go play. Um, I saw a video and I don't even know if it's true or not, but did you guys see the video of Trey Young going and hooping in Oklahoma? Is that, I, you know, I think, you know, so, so, I, you know, I don't, but guys want to hoop, guys want to play, guys want to compete. Um, but like you said, guys want to, you know, the, I think the league wanted to be as, as safe as possible, whatever that means, you know, um, going forward in, in, in our new reality. Um, this, is, this is our world that we live in now. And, um, and we'll, okay, so what does safe as, as possible mean? Well, the multiple testing, making sure that we're not taking testing away from others that, that need to be tested. Um, so, they're, you know, they're, they're, the players are feel safe, the coaches, referees, basketball staff, um, that we have proper testing in place, um, that we have proper, proper protocols in place. Um, you know, that all the logistics are worked out so that it is as safe as possible going forward um, so that people can have some level of comfort, understanding that this is the, the situation going forward and that we've done taken every precaution that we can uh, to, um, you know, to, to, to play basketball and compete for a championship in as safe as environment as possible. I don't know. I think, I think I, do you have any more? Okay. I, I, I really no, love I, I do actually. Go I ahead. do. So, Cause <laughs> I know you're a competitor, Jaron, your playing days um, in the NBA, 2011 to sorry, 2001 to 2011, not that long ago, but I, I am kind of curious. Could you play today? Like would your game, has the NBA changed? So much? You'd be like, a stretch four. That's what I'm saying. Like stretch in what five. ways would you play? Uh, First of all, I'm a stretch five. I don't know if you okay. guys, you guys have, you guys have been to the gym early, especially over at Oracle. You guys have seen my, seen my 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 my, my corner threes. Jerry, yeah. you have a point to show us. You say, "Hey, look I, at me," and you shoot the <laughs> shot. We we. It's not that. Oh, I don't know if you guys are there. We see you do we this. We see you. Like, hey, look, look at this. So 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 what I'm saying is, um, I, I've expanded my game. <laughs> and um, I saw the viral, the viral video of a uh, big perk um, doing the ball handling. The handles, yeah. Uh, uh, the handling, and I'm about to put my own video out. I saw the sham guy. I can be, but he only did it right to left. I can do it left to right and right to left. Wow. So, all, all I'm saying is, you know, my my game has grown immensely. Are you leading um, the break, Jaron? Are you are you are you yeah. center right nah, now? No, 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 no. See, I'm a half court player, so this okay. is what happens. Okay. So. <laughs> <laughs> So, no, 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 you know, I'm going to, I get, you get to pick a side because, you know, transition isn't my game. So I'll be on offense or defense, but uh, usually if I can stay on offense, just put me in the corner, uh, I'm, I'm good to go. Um, but no, I, you know, the, the game has definitely changed um, a lot. There's a lot more skill involved now. Um, multiple positions, obviously, you got to be able to defend multiple positions. Um, the game has definitely changed. But having said that, um, my game has changed as well. So hey, oh. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm more like I'm more I'm more like my guy Channing Fry nowadays. Just put me Ooh. in the corner. Yeah, hey. What if what if what if you had what if you had the jumper? If you developed the jumper in like yeah. 05, I'm like oh six. Scary. Scary. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie to you. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> who when you when you were in the league and you had to defend somebody, like who was the player who gave you the most fits? Who was the matchup that you were like, oh, this guy, okay. All of them. <laughs> uh, Talk about Shaq. Uh, I mean, Talk about Shaq. Uh, Shaq, uh, you see that wall behind me? Try mm -hmm. to move that wall. Uh, so, you know, people always say, okay, who's the hardest person to play against? Who's the hardest guy to defend? Uh, automatically, you jump into my mind, um, Shaq and Tim Duncan uh, for two different reasons. Shaq was just a, his physical strength was incredible. And my brother and I used to defend him and, you know, we'd talk about, okay, strategy in trying to defend Shaq. And 
we would flop, quite frankly. We would try to draw offensive fouls and try to, you know, try to get them out of the game that way. And Shaq knew that my brother and I would flop against us. So the, his very first post move and his very first foul that he would go against us, he would get his money's worth. So he would go, so if he'd be on the right block, he'd take two hard dribbles to the middle and then drop step back to the baseline. But when he would drop step, he'd put all 350, however much, 340, whatever it was, into this right arm and just take this whole thing and just try to, <laughs> and just try to you know, put me to sleep right there. And um, so this, this physical strength, I would definitely say Shaq. And then just skill. Um, and probably one of the nicest guys is, is Tim Duncan, but just man, that guy is just so skillful, just so so skilled as a basketball player. Um, he, he, you try to take away players' A moves, you try to take away their counters, you try to take away their B moves, and then when a guy goes to the C move and he's still killing you, it's just like, all right, man, I need some help. <laughs> when, when's the double coming? <laughs> uh, so uh, t- Timmy for sure. Uh, you know, guys against played against Chris Weber, Rashid Wallace, Kevin Garnett. Um, you know, every night, Elton Brand. You know, you just go down the list of guys every night. Man, it was – I mean, guys are talented in this league. One, I want to acknowledge the fact that you are the first person that I have seen on record admit to flopping. I just want to oh. say – I don't know if you get a – get a medal or something for that. Yes. Like, I, I, can, I commend you for that. So, Second. Go ahead. Um, what is going through your mind, like, the night before? You get to L.A. the night before you guys are playing the Lakers and Shaq is, 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 is you know you're guarding Shaq. And what's, what's the uh, mindset when you're in San Antonio the night before you're about to play Tim? To me, like, like I said um, at the beginning, that I'm so competitive. I love it. It, it, was, it was my dream to play in the NBA. So I, I, I loved it. I, I loved the challenge of playing in Shaq. I'm like, okay, I got to run him. I got I to gotta, I gotta get up and down the floor. I got to try and get him tired. I got to, on, on, on defense, I got to try to meet him early, hit him first, so that when he tries to reestablish position, I'm ready to fall. I'm ready to, <laughs> I'm ready to, try, I'm ready to try and pick up a foul. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you, you know, I, I think there are situations where, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to play the mind game. Okay, what can I do to be successful against these guys? Um, you know, going into each game, and I, like I said, I, I, I lived a dream for 10 years playing against the best athletes, the best guys in the world, and I, I look forward to it. I look forward to those, those opportunities to compete against the, against the best. Does, does Tim Duncan talk trash? No. No, <laughs> no. I know Shaq does. Are you lying right now? Does he ever say anything? No, he'll, he'll say like, hey, that was a good move or something. Like, just something like, oh, oh that, that was good. Like, you know, just something like real subtle. He would say, look, so after he hits a jumper, he'd be like, that was a good move. He'll tell himself that was, that was a good move. Yeah. No, 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 just like, he, he, he really didn't say anything. Shaq would talk. Um, you know, certain guys, Rasheed Wallace, Kevin, uh, Kevin Garnett, those guys would ab- absolutely talk. Um, you know, there are a lot of guys who, who were um, very vocal out there. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that wasn't my game. I wasn't the guy going to go out there. I'm not trying the guy that, to try to add uh, gasoline to the fire. I'm not that guy. So, uh, <laughs> so I, I remember one time uh, Danny Fortson got so mad at me. Uh, he was, you know, former warrior player. Mm-hmm. And, and I was flopping and drawing fouls against him and, you know, setting, setting screens and, you know, just being physical. And anyway, just playing my game out there. And one of the things I used to do to try to get underneath the guy's skin, if I knew that they, if they were, you know, trying to talk stuff or whatever, I, I would try to be extra nice. And then that would make them even angrier. So... <laughs> Um, you know, Danny Ports, I remember one time, like, uh, he, he, he probably not even remember this, but we were playing in Utah and he was saying something and I said, and it was like right around the holidays and I said, oh man, it's right around the holidays. You got your family in town? Everybody good? Is everything good? Your family? <laughs> and I go, I'm just trying to be like super duper nice. Like, oh man, can't wait to, you know, get up. And then he, and he said some choice words to me, you know, like, I can't even repeat them. 
And I just said, Danny, I'm sorry. It's just my game. <laughs> I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> so, you know, there are cer- certain ways that you try to, uh, you know, you're just trying to gain a competitive edge. Um, yeah. And I hear your stories of uh, Michael, Jordan, or other guys taking guys out the night before or something like that. And just so that they could, you know, gain an edge on them, you know, the, you know, on the court, you know. So everybody's looking for a, a competitive uh, advantage out there on the floor. I was not blessed with the uh, gift of gab that uh, Draymond possesses. Um, talk about and, your gift of gab, please. I know. You're Is trash talk a lost art? Yeah, tell Ooh. us about Draymond. How does he, how does he, what Ooh. kind of part of his game is, is that mouth? Man, he's he, he cut from a different cloth, as they say. And he doesn't uh, so, turn it off. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. There's no, nah. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's only one speed. And, uh, and, I, and, and it was so funny. It was one time, um, I remember I think we were playing Sacramento, and, and it was because Kevin, Kevin Durant and DeMarcus, those, and, and Draymond. So it was the three of them. And they were getting on uh, some young fella from uh, Sacramento. Man, I feel bad for the young man. <laughs> I feel bad for that young man. Is he still in the league? <laughs> uh, he is not. He is not. And uh, anyway, that, man, th- th- those guys, they, they, you know, so the s- situation can come up where um, you got to be able to, um, you know, so, you know, you let your game talk or, or both, or you let, let your game and your mouth talk. So, you know, Who's some guys have, have the ability to do both. Who's the most underrated trash talker on the Warriors? I, I, my money, I think, is on Steph. Could be Clay, but my money's on Steph for the most underrated trash talker. I, you know, I don't hear a lot what's being said out there on the floor anymore. Um, you know, I'm, I'm close, but I'm not out there with those guys. Um, I can hear Draymond. I can hear everybody. We can, can hear, hear Draymond, Draymond from way up everybody there. Can hear, everybody can hear Draymond. But uh, I, don't, I couldn't tell you who the most, like, underrated trash – trash talker is um I, I don't know i'd probably say clay um but i don't know clay okay is clay style because to us it doesn't look like he says a lot but when he does is it like bah got you knockout punch <laughs> uh i you know again I, I i can't speak i'm not out there on the on the floor with those guys so i can't i can't say it but i i, I do i do see him moving his moving the lips uh so I, occasionally but um, you know, but he, he, he but the, the the best thing about Clay, and this is just because he's all heart. You know, he he just he just he lets his game talk. I mean, his his game. He's doesn't really nothing really seems to phase him. He's just right out there, just letting his game talk on both ends of the floor, getting after it. And like I said, it, like it, 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 it's an honor and it's really a privilege to coach these guys and work with these guys. One more thing about talk, if that's okay, because when these games happen in Orlando, there's not going to be fans in the stands. So there's going to be microphones picking up a lot more things that would ordinarily be covered by some sound. What do you think that's going to be like for guys where, where talk is part of their game and now everything's out there in the open? Everybody can hear it. I don't know. Some guys need to work on their material the night before, I guess. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Do uh, you need a paywall? Yeah. I yeah I don't know I don't know I don't know about any of that um, I I think it it'll be um, I think it it has the potential to be very enlightening um, for for fans and uh, for you know people to 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 actually hear what's being said um, it was one of those situations that we played a game in Madison Square Garden um, this was maybe two years ago I can't remember but for the first half there was no there was no ambient noise there was no like you know, they play the announce the, the the you know a soundtrack, no no pumped in crowd noise. There was nothing. There was and you could you could it was it was one it was weird. It, it was a weird game to participate in because you could hear every single thing that was being said on the court, um, and it was just weird not to have that that energy um, from from the the noise being pumped in, or the, even soundtrack or music or anything. Um, so I, I think it'll be a, an adjustment period for the players. But like, like I said, guys want to play. Guys are competitive. They want to go out there and compete. Um, and I think it'll be great to see once, once uh, basketball is back up and running. If you're going to watch as a fan, do you have a pick for the championship this year? 
if I'm gonna watch, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. But um, I, I, I don't have a pick. Um, I have a lot of friends in the um, coaching profession, and I like to see them um, achieve success. Um, so I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't have a, a horse in the race, as they say. Um, but I, I'm a fan of basketball and a, and a good basketball, and I want to see execution. And I want to see. Um, the emotion, the energy, the passion back out there on the floor as we all do. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm, 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 I'm excited and I'm looking forward to basketball being back. So your pick is someone, a team other than the Warriors is basically your pick, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> by default, yes. What, yes. Is, what is that like though? Because I mean, I've been on the beat, it's my third year. All I'm used to is seeing the, you know, the Warriors being in the playoffs and going to the finals. What is it like now you're saying the, this year the Warriors, they're not, they're not in the playoffs. The Warriors are not going to join the, play, the postseason. What is the, when you hear that, and I know how the season has been, you know, I know yeah. everything that's going on, but to hear that sentence, how does that make you feel? When I hear that, there, then I, the only thing that's coming to mind is there's work to be done. Mm -hmm. And we got a lot of work to be done. So we got to get back at it. And the sooner the better. We talked about a lot. Logan, is there any other topic you want to touch on? I'm just happy to see Jaron, man. I haven't seen Me him. Me too. Me too. I, I miss the halftime it. chats walking down the hallway. It's really good to hear your voice and to, uh, and to know yeah. you're doing well. I, I appreciate it. Good to, good to see you guys as well and hear your voices. And I appreciate you guys having me on. And I don't know if the 360s are coming back. I'm, I'm growing it out a little bit. Logan, you got the hair going. That's Bro. Nice. <laughs> oh. There's no 360 here, my man. There's hey. nothing going on right now. Hey man, they open them shops back up, brother. Let's go get you know, they... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Great sometimes. Uh, uh, all right. Thank you, Jared. Uh, well, I appreciate it. Thank you guys for having me on. All right. Take care. See you guys.